So I'm gonna pray. Father God, protect me from my enemies that surround me. Protect me from all harm and keep me focused on you, not these people. Because it's nothing but the double strategies, works of the Satan. Trying to like interfere with me, like, because he knows that I'm really not about drama, really. Just hear about living peaceful life and just mind my business and worry about my affairs in my own apartment and stick to myself and focus on you. I pray that you keep me focused on you and keep me safe and um, give me wisdom. Amen. just have to not say anything I know I don't want nobody to hear because a lot of people here are nosy 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 and my life doesn't concern them like it doesn't concern them like when I go outside or how many times I stay in the house doesn't concern them who I'm talking to. Doesn't concern nothing about them, about me. Only um concerns about me. The only, like, person is God. And my kids. Other than that, these people need to mind their business. Right on my door. Mind your business. Straight up. Mind your business. Is it that hard? It must be. Because they're like. So worried about other people's life. Because they're so unhappy in their own life.
Psalm, Luke chapter 10. But I don't get it. Like, I thought it was like kind of weird too. Like, I don't know. I'm thinking too much or something. But it was weird. He moved his sister above me, and then he moved out. Like, you're not even staying here. So you had your sister move up there upstairs. Like, why? And you knew that situation wasn't going to work anyway. Like, with her kids dumping constantly. Like, that was, like, the stupidest move ever. If they think somebody has to, like... Like a human being, I'm human being. I have to like hear that twenty four seven a day, like every single day, like nonstop stumping. How would that make you feel? I don't know. And next time. I moved to an apartment. I'm not going to move to the second floor. I'm not going to move to the first floor. I'm going to move to the third floor. So there's nobody above me because I can't deal with that kids stomping. It's like too much for me. What the weird thing is, say that guy has an agenda because I was looking at my door and then I see him walking and I was just looking out my door, like looking out, like, and then I see him walking his dog, like, and then he was like looking back at me, like, kept looking back at me, like, why? Like, he sounds, he's suspicious the way he looks at me. Like, why are you looking at me like that? You know something's up with him. That's why he had his sister move above me, because he knew that was going to happen. Like, he has an agenda with him. And he knows that I'm a quiet person. So that leads it off. Quiet people. Quiet person doesn't talk much. He knows offer a lot, like, and I didn't never even have a conversation with him. I didn't talk to him, not for, never talk to him. When he, like, say hi, like, and I'm not really, like, saying hi to people, like, because I'm very, like, laid back, shy. Not because I'm stuck up, but I'm just, like, autistic, shy.
I don't know. I think it's like messed up when people like the like people they don't understand like what introvert is and they try to like make you somebody they want to make you as something they want to make you like everybody else like you have to talk a lot just like them or something you have to be like them like i want to be like you like i'm being myself like like how I am, like laid back, chill, introverted. Everybody's not gonna wanna like talkative like you. I like to observe people, observe them, watch them. something tell people like when I go outside like I can go outside when I want to go outside if I don't want to want to go outside I want to go outside like leave me alone like get a life I don't need your help I have Christ I don't need you unless I say I need you like leave me alone I'm stupid. Keep thinking I'm stupid. It's your dumb interpretation of me. Oh, 
Luke chapter 10. The Lord now chose 72 other disciples and sent them ahead in pairs to all the towns and places. He planned to visit these. To visit. These were his instructions to them. The harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest and ask him to send more workers into field in his fields. And now go and remember that I am sending you out as lambs of my wolves. Don't take any money with you, not a traveler's bag, nor an extra pair of sandals. And don't stop to greet anyone on the road. Whenever you enter someone's home, first say, may, God pe- may God's peace be on you. Be on this house. If those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they are not, the blessing will return to you. Don't move around from home to home and stay in one place eating and drinking what they provide and don't hesitate to accept hospitality because those work. Those who work deserve their pay. If you enter a town and it welcomes you, eat whatever it sets before you. Heal the sick and tell them, The kingdom of God is near you now. But if a town refuses to welcome you, go out into its streets and say, We wipe even the dust of your town from their feet to show that we have abandoned you to your fate. And know this, this kingdom of God is near. I assure you, even wicked Sodom will be better off than such a town on Judgment Day. What sorrow awaits you, Chorazin and Bethsaida? For if the miracles I did in you had been done in the wicked, Tyre and Sidon, their people would have repented of their sins a long ago clothing themselves in burlap and throwing ashes on their heads to show their remorse. Yes, Tyre and Sidon will be better off on Judgment Day in you than you. And you people of Caprium will you be honored in heaven. No, you will go down to the place of the dead. Then he said to the disciples, Anyone who accepts your message is also accepting me, and anyone who rejects you is rejecting me. And anyone who rejects me is rejecting God who sent me. When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. And look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. The Lord and and the teachings of the law of Moses was probably not sincere in his question. He was trying to trick the Savior to put him freely to the test. Perhaps he thought that the Lord would redoubtable the law to him. Jesus was only a teacher, and eternal life was something he could earn or merit. The Lord took all this into consideration when he answered him. If the Lord had been humble and penitent, the Savior would have answered him more directly. Under the circumstances, Jesus directed his attention to the law. What did the law demand? It demanded that man love the Lord supremely and his neighbor as himself. Jesus told him that if he did this, he will live. At first, it might appear that the Lord was teaching salvation by law keeping. Such was not the case. God never intended that anyone should be ever be saved by keeping the law. The Ten Commandments were given to people who were already sinners. The purpose of the law is not to save from sin, but to produce knowledge of sin. The function of the law is to show man what a guilty sinner he is. It is impossible for sinful man to love God with all his heart and his neighbor as himself if he could do this from birth to death he would not need salvation he would not be lost but even then his reward would only be long life on earth not eternal life in heaven as long as he lived sinlessly he would go on living eternal life is only for sinners who acknowledge their lost condition and who are saved by god's grace Thus Jesus' statement, do this and you will live, was purely the hypocritical 
I don't know that word, the high political, if his reference to the law had its desired effect on the lower, he would have said, if that's what God requires, then I am lost, helpless, and hopeless. I cast myself on your love and mercy. Save me by your grace. Instead of that, he sought to justify himself. Why should he? No one had accused him. There was no consciousness of fault, and his heart rose up in pride. To resist, he asked, who is my neighbor? It was an insulsive tactic on his part. It was an answer to that question that the Lord, Jesus, told the story of the Good Samaritan. The details of the story are familiar. The rabbi victim, almost certainly a Jew, lay half naked dead on the road to Jericho, and the Jewish priest and Levite refused to help. Perhaps they feared it was a plot or were afraid that they too might be robbed if they tarried. It was a hated Samaritan who came to the rescue, who applied first aid, who took the victim to an inn, and who made provision for his care. To the Samaritan, a Jew in need was his neighbor. Then the Savior asked the unquestionable question, incapable question, which of the three proved the neighbor to the helpless man? The one who showed mercy, of course. Yes, of course. Then the Lord should go and do likewise. If a Samaritan could prove himself a true neighbor to a Jew by showing mercy to him, then all men are neighbors. It is not difficult for us to see in the priest and Levite a preacher, a preacher of the powerless, the powerlessness of the law to help the dead sinner. The law commanded, love your neighbor as yourself, but it did not give the power to obey. Neither it is Neither is it difficult to identify the good Samaritan with the Lord Jesus, who came to where we were saved, who saved us from our sin and made full provision for us, from earth to heaven and through all eternity. Priests and Levites may disappoint us, but the good Samaritan never does. The story of the good Samaritan had an unexpected twist to it. It started off to answer the question, who is my neighbor? But it ended by posing the question, to whom do you prove yourself a neighbor? So, that's it. Ten for the eight. So read about the um the seventy the seventy sent forth. This is the only account in the gospels of the Lord sending out the seventy disciples. It closely resembles the commissioning of the twelve in Matthew ten. However, there the disciples were sent into the northern areas where Whereas the 70 are now being sent to the south along the route the Lord was following to Jerusalem, this mission was seemingly intended to prepare the way for the Lord in his journey from Castro Philippia in north through Galilee and Samaria across the Jordan south through Peria, then back across the Jordan to Jerusalem. While the missionary in office of the 70 
was only temporary. Nevertheless, our Lord's instructions to these men suggest many life principles which apply to Christian in every age. Some of these principles may be summarized as follows. He sent them out by two. This suggests competent testimony in the mouth of two. Our free witnesses, every word shall be established. Second Corinthians chapter 13, 1. The Lord's servant should constantly pray that he were sent out laborers into the harvest field. <coughs> it is always greater than the supply of workers. In praying for our laborers, we must be willing to go ourselves. Obviously, notice, pray. Disciples of Jesus are sent forth into a hostile environment. They are to out. They are to outward appearances like defenseless lambs among wolves. They cannot expect to be treated royally by the world, but rather to be persecuted and even killed. The consideration of personal comfort are not to be permitted. Carry neither money bag, knapsack, nor sandals. The money bags speak of financial reserves. The knapsack should ask food reserves. The sandals may prefer either to an extra pair or to footgear, afford an extra comfort. All three speak of the poverty, which though having nothing yet possess all things and makes many rich. Second Corinthians chapter six verse ten. Greet no one along the road. Christ's servants are not to waste time and long. Samaria's greetings, such as for coming in the east, while they should be courteous and civil, they must utilize their time in their glorious proclamation of the gospel. Rather than profitless, profitless talk, there is not time for needless delays. They should accept hospitality whatever is offered to them. If their interim greeting is favorably received, then the host is a son of peace. He is a man paralyzed by peace, and the one who receives the message of peace. If the disciples are refused, they should not be discouraged. Their peace will return to them again. That is, there has been no waste or loss, and others will receive it. The disciples should remain in the same house, that first offering lodging. <laughs> To move from house to house might paralyze them as those who are shopping for the most luxurious accommodations where they should live simply and gratefully. They should not hesitate to eat whatever food and drink are offered to them. As servants of the Lord, they are entitled to their upkeep. The cities and towns take a portion either for or against the Lord, just as individuals do. If an heir is receptive to the message, the disciples should preach there, accept its hospitality, and bring the blessing of the gospel to it. Christ's servants should eat such things as are set before them. Not being fastiest about their food or causing inconvenience in their home. After all, food was not the main thing in their lives. Towns which received the Lord's messengers still have their sin, sick and habit till also the king draws very near to them. This is so long. Cities and towns take a potion either for or against the Lord, just as an individual. If an area receptive to the message, the disciples should preach there, accept its hospitality, and bring the blessing of the gospel to it. Christ's servants should eat such things are set before them, not being fastened about their food or causing inconvenience in the home. After food is not to me, yeah, I read that already. A child may reject the gospel and then be denied the privilege of hearing it again. There comes a time in God's dealings when the message is heard for the last time. Men should not trifle with the gospel because it may be withdrawn forever. Light rejected is light denied. Towns and villages which are privileged to hear the good news and which refuse it will be judged more severely than the city of Sodom. The greater privilege of the greater the responsibility so as jesus spoke these words he reminded of the free cities of galilee which he had been more highly privileged than other any others they had been seeing him perform his mighty miracles in their streets and they had heard his gracious teachings yet they utterly refused him if the miracles he had done in Persian and Bethsaida had been done in ancient Tyre and Sada and those sea calls, them sea coast cities would have plunged themselves into the deepest repentance.
because the cities of Galilee were unmoved by Jesus' works and their judgment would be more severe than that of Tyre and Sidon. As a matter of historical fact, Treasure and Bethsaida have been so freely destroyed that their exact location is not definitely known today. Capron became the hometown of Jesus after he moved from Nazareth. The city was a dollar to heaven and privileged, but in despite its most notable citizens and missed its day opportunity, so it would be brought down to aids and judgment. Jesus closed his instructions to the seventy with a statement that they were his ambassadors. To reject them was to reject him, and to refuse him was to refuse God the Father. Where our comments, there is probably no stronger language than this in the New Testament about the dignity of a faithful minister's office and the guilt incurred by those who refuse to hear this message. It is a language we must remember, which is not addressed to the twelve apostles, but to the seventy disciples, of whose name and subject history we know nothing. Scott remarks to reject an ambassador or to treat him with contempt is an affront to the prince who commissioned and sent him, and whom he perpetrated. Uh, represents the apostles and 70 disciples were the ambassadors and representatives of Christ and they who rejected and despised them in fact rejected and despised them as they returned from their mission the 70 were Elated that even the demons had been subject to them, Jesus' reply may be understood in two ways. First, it may mean that he saw in their success in earnest of their eventual fall of Satan from heaven. James Fawcett and Brown paraphrased his words, I followed you in your mission and watched it trumps while you are wondering at the subject to you of demons in my name. A grander spectacle was open into my view and sudden as the darling of lightning from heaven to earth, low Satan was beheld, falling from heaven. This fall of Satan is still future. He will be cast out of heaven by Michael and his angels, Revelation chapter 12, 7, 9. And this will take place during the tribulation period and prior to Christ's glorious reign on earth. The second possible interpretation of Jesus' words is as a warning against prior. It as if he was for saying, yes, you are quite heady because even the demons have been subject to you. But just remember, pride is the parent sin. It was pride that resulted in the fall of Lucifer and in the being casted out of heaven. See that you avoid this prayer. The Lord had given his disciples authority against the forces of evil, and they were granted immunity from harm during their mission. It is true of all God's servants, they are protected. Yet they were not to rejoice in their power over spirits, but rather in their own salvation. This is the only recorded instance when the Lord told his disciples not to rejoice. There are subtle dangers connected with success in Christian service, whereas the fact that our names are written in heaven reminds us of our infinite debt to the God and his Son. It is safe to rejoice in salvation by grace. Rejected by the mass of the people, Jesus looked upon him as, upon his humble followers and rejoice in the spirit thanking the father for his matchless wisdom the 70 were not the wise and prudent men of this world they were not the intelligentsicals or scholars they were mere babes but they were babes with faith devotion and unquestioning obedience the intellectual were too wise too knowing too clever for their own good and their pride blinded them to the true worth of god's beloved son it is through babes that God can work most effectively. Our Lord was happy for all those whom the Father had given to him, and for this entire success of Sub 70, which foretold the eventual downfall of Satan. All things were delivered to the Son of by his Father, whether things in heaven on earth or under the earth. God put the entire universe under the authority of his Son. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. There is mystery connected with the incarnation that no one but the Father could fathom how God could become man and dwell in the human body is beyond the comprehension of the creature. No one knows who the Father is except the Father and Son. 
And the one to a woman's son wills to reveal him. God, too, is above hearing understanding. The son knows him perfectly, and the son has revealed him to the weak, the base, and the despised the people who have faith in him. Verse Corinthians chapter 1, verse 26, verse 29. Those who have seen the Son have seen the Father. The only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, has fully told forth the Father. John chapter 1, verse 18. As Kelly says, the Son does reveal the Father, but man's mind always breaks itself to pieces when it attempts to unravel the unsuitable and meaning of Christ's personal glory. Probably the Lord told his disciples that they were living in a day of unpredicted privilege. Old Testament prophets and kings had the desire to see the days of the Messiah, but had not seen them. And the Lord Jesus here claims to be the one to whom the Old Testament prophets look forward. The Messiah disciples were privileged to see the miracles and hear the teaching of the hope of Israel. That was 10. Chapter 10, all the way to 10, 23. The next one is Luke chapter 10, verse 25. Is the Bible um my Bible breaks the um the scripture down into the paragraphs. The most important commandment. Bye guys, I'm gonna walk because I need to walk. Bye.